So we saw in an earlier video that there's an error of time, that spontaneous processes tend to go in, in one direction and not the other. So why? So we can figure this out if we, instead of looking at an ice cube with quadrillions and quadrillions of water molecules, let's look at a much simpler system. Let's imagine a bucket of plastic letters, and we're going to take those letters, and we're going to put those letters on a fridge. And we're going to spell out the first page of Harry Potter. We'll do book one. Okay, so we've got the first page of Harry Potter, uh, Harry Potter spelled out with the plastic letters, you know, the kind that you, you spell stuff on in the fridge. Maybe little kids use them. And what we're going to do is we're going to unleash on the fridge 100 monkeys. Okay, so I guess it's pretty crowded, so maybe we're going to have a, a giant fridge that's maybe uh, 40 feet wide or something like that. So it's big enough to spell out the first page of Harry Potter in plastic letters, and we've got 100 monkeys, and we let them play. And the monkeys can move the letters around. Well, we know what's going to happen. We know we end up with the letters be arranged in a way that is just gibberish. It doesn't spell out anything. Okay. So we know this is going to happen. We could say that this is, in fact, spontaneous. OK, now let's imagine the reverse process of just taking the letters and putting them in a random order on the fridge and then letting the monkeys play with them. And we wait until the first page of Harry Potter is spelled out. Does this happen? No. We know that if we do this once, twice, three times, we even do it a hundred different times. We never see monkeys taking gibberish and rearranging the letters to form Harry Potter. So we have to come up for a reason. Why does this not happen? Why does this process not happen? And the other process is spontaneous. And we have to come up with some sort of hypothesis. So one hypothesis would be well, monkeys, just like Harry Potter. Well, that's obviously nonsense. So there must be some other reason. And the reason for this is just the laws of probability. So we have to think about how many different ways there are of spelling out the first page of Harry Potter. So the ways of doing this. How many ways are there of arranging the letters of Harry Potter to make the first, the letters to make the first page of Harry Potter? There's only one way of doing this. There's only one arrangement of letters that correctly spells out the first page of Harry Potter. What about gibberish? If we define gibberish as being uh, uh, nothing that's spelled out, there's no correct sentences. Maybe the words aren't even correct. W would equal a huge number. Okay, a huge number. And so the number of ways of spelling out just gibberish, putting things in what looks like a random order, that's a very big number. The number of ways of arranging it correctly is one. The key thing is that the monkeys are essentially random actors. They're moving the letters around in a way that's random. So we probably should note this. Monkeys are moving randomly. They're a random motion. And so if you have something that can only be arranged in one way, and then we unleash the forces of randomness on it, it's hard to find your way back. It's sort of like this. If you imagine a similar analogy would be saying, if I take a deck of cards and shuffle them many times, is it likely that I'll get a hand that's worthless or that I'll get a very valuable poker hand like a straight flush? You're very unlikely to get the straight flush, and that's because there's really few ways of getting that, and there's lots of ways of getting bad poker hands. Okay, so probability favors going from a W that's small to a W that's big. The laws of probability just say it's more likely to go to something where there's more ways of getting it. We can link this analogy with monkeys to what we actually see with molecules. So imagine the plastic letters actually stand for 
units of energy. And the monkeys, what are the monkeys? They're the monkeys. The monkeys are things that are able to shuffle around the plastic letters. So what shuffle around units of energy? Random thermal motion. So then if we ask what makes this forward process spontaneous and the backward process non-spontaneous, we could say it's that we want to go to a bigger W. And so we can make a statement here that the universe goes toward higher values of W. Okay, now what does all this have to do with chemistry? Well, Boltzmann came up with a definition of entropy that we're going to use, and so I'll write it here. He, this definition of entropy, so S is entropy, and entropy is a constant times the natural logarithm of W. So Boltzmann's constant is just a number. It's actually the gas constant R divided by Avogadro's number. And that comes out to be 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per kelvin. So it's just a, it's just a constant. So this constant times the logarithm of the number of ways of arranging your units of energy gives you the entropy of the system. Now we just said the universe goes towards higher values of W. Well, if it goes to higher values of W, that implies that the universe should go to higher values of entropy. So we can write this as delta S for the universe is going to be a positive number, greater than or equal to zero. So if W goes up for the entire universe, then it must be S is going up for the entire universe. And now we have the statement, and this statement actually has a name. This is called the second law of thermodynamics. And we can see it makes sense as long as we use this definition of entropy, because higher values of W just means more probable, and so of course the universe is going to evolve to a more probable state from a less probable state and not the reverse. We have to be careful when you use the second law because the universe is composed of many, many different things. And so we can rewrite this if we want as delta S for the system, which is whatever part of the universe we're studying at that moment, plus the surroundings, which is everything else, that total change has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now please be careful here. There's a common misconception that the delta S of the system has to be positive, and that's not true. It's the total entropy that is the entropy change of the universe, because we can, we can show that this is just in the way of writing that, that the total entropy change in the universe has to be positive, not just the entropy change of various pieces. We'll see later, for instance, that when we freeze water, the entropy of the water goes down. But that doesn't violate the second law because if water freezes, it's going to release heat, and that heat can increase the entropy of the surroundings. And we'll look at numerical calculations, how we actually calculate delta S for various things like phase transitions and taking heat in and out of a system 